whenever your pastor asked me to come, I thought he said it's going to be on uh, pretty open ended, right? Creation, and, and I guess I better stand over here, right? Um, creation and um, what was it? Creation and uh, the fall. And it was one other word that he used there too. So I thought to myself, well, if I am going to um, begin the week of Bible school, I guess maybe we ought to start looking at creation. It's probably the best place to start out. And then I came in here and I saw you have all your in the beginning signs and all this stuff up. So uh, you're in pretty good shape. And so um, I thought I would just uh, sort of give you an overview tonight. I'm going to spend a little bit on the first part and a little bit on the last part. The creation and the fall. And then we'll kind of skim over the rest of it pretty briefly. But I want to basically start with these first couple verses. And one thing I've noticed about Genesis chapter 1 is this. Really, uh, we find that this is very uh, something that is pretty well assumed, isn't it? Uh, whenever you start these two verses, these first two verses, uh, we find that um, uh, these two verses really set the tone for everything that we believe in. Everything goes on because of who they are and what they're all about. And um, if you don't, and I've heard, if you all been to Ken Ham, I'm sure you have, Creation Museum. Some of us have. And uh, you know, that's one of his big themes. If you don't believe the first book of the Bible, maybe the first chapter of the Bible, you don't believe any of it. And I think that's true. You've got to have it all, it has to all hang together. And you know, these first three chapters of Genesis really set the tone for everything. And I want to just sort of um, give you sort of a, uh, a glimpse of these things and make some observations about them because uh, a lot of people are attacking this part of the scriptures today. A lot of individuals are saying it's not true, that you can't believe it, and it's uh, fairy tales or it's myths or whatever you want to say. And um, so we don't want to you know, fall into that trap, of course, and we don't want to allow ourselves to get involved in something called a gap theory. If you know what that is, there's a gap between verses 2 and 3. And, some people, even the Schofield Bible used to talk about that. So that's sort of been debunked in this day and age in which we live. But um, this is a very, very attacked part of Scripture. And so to, to this evening, I want to just sort of uh, uh, begin by looking at these first few verses, especially the first two. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You said that this is probably, I understand, to be the best known verse in Scripture except for John 3.16. If anybody knows any verse of Scripture, they know John 3, 16, they probably know Genesis 1, 1, right? I would say everybody in this room can tell me Genesis 1, 1 without even thinking because it's something that you and I know a long time ago. And so it says, in the beginning, and the word, do you know what the word Genesis means? I'm sure you do. It means beginnings. beginnings, doesn't it? That's what the word itself means. And so it's an idea of what uh, this is all about. And most of the things that you and I just take for granted, we don't even think about are all found right here in these first two chapters, the first three chapters, really. Let me give you a list of uh, all the things that are found in these chapters. I'll be going here just a second because um, there's a lot of things that you find here that to us is just sort of commonplace. Uh, the idea of the universe, it's found here because God creates it. The idea of heaven, the idea of the earth, marriage, family, boy, that's a hot topic this day and age, isn't it? Marriage and family and all those things that are going on. The idea of a covenant. You ever made a covenant with somebody? A promise? Sin. Salvation. Civilization. Society. Government. Nations. Races. All of these are found in this first part of Genesis, especially chapters 1 through 12. But uh, they're found in those areas. And as you know, Israel, the promised land, is all found here. It all starts here. Somebody told me one time that you can really define Genesis by, and you've probably heard this, four events and four people. You know what those four events and four people would be? What are the four events? Creation. Creation. Fall. The fall. Flood. 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 And? Christ. Babel. Tower of Babel. And so you've got four events that really gives to you chapters 1 through 12. The creation, the flood, no, I'm sorry, creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. And so those events are really what the whole description is about. And you've got four people that are the last part, verses chapters 13 through the end of the chapter, verse chapter 40. And I'm sure you know who these are. Who are those four people? Adam. No. 
No, chapters 12. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Abraham. Abraham. Isaac. His son. Isaac. His Isaac. son. Jacob. Jacob. His son. Joseph. You got it. If you got those four events and those four people, that's what Genesis is. You know, it's all about because now there's other people that come into the scenes, of course, and interact with those folks. But that is really the whole event of what's going on. So all of that's found here in this first chapter of the Bible. It's all given to us here really very, very quickly. And not only that, this verse is also the foundation verse for the Bible as well. Um, again, most widely read verse because most of the time when you start a book, if you're like me, you start the first verse and then when you get tired of it, you quit. Now I'll say the Bible. But another book, you know, I get tired of about chapter 4. And I turn on and do something else because it doesn't hold my interest. I don't have to read it. But the Bible's not that way. Well, usually when you start something, and most people are going to start the Bible, they're going to, they're going to bring it open. First thing they see is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So this is one of those things that's very, very well known. And again, if you have difficulty believing this, you have difficulty believing everything in the Bible. Because this really does set the tone for all that's going to happen. Because this refutes all the ideas that people have today about origins and about uh, the meaning of this world and what it's all about. It all starts right here in this verse. And this idea here, this verse, is really God's first. He's the first cause, and he's the one that starts it all. Now, the Bible makes no attempt to prove God. You know, most of the time, if you do some kind of a scientific experiment, you take uh, a thesis, and then you go to it's a Hegel's idea anyway, and you take ant an antithesis, and then you put them together, and you have something in the middle. Well, you know, you, or you go through things to try to prove something theorems. God doesn't do that. All he does is just throw it out there for us. He doesn't assume, or he doesn't have any kind of evidence. He doesn't go through and say, now here's what this is all. No, he just simply starts off by saying, in the beginning, God. And you know, there's no uh, even attempt to prove that God exists. You just take it for granted. You just make an assumption. Now, we make assumptions all the time, don't we? You know, it's pretty basic for our lives. And so making assumptions is not anything out of the ordinary, but it's important to understand that. In the Bible, this is, the, this is a book that is from God, so it doesn't need any kind of uh, being edited at all. It's from God, so it gives to us these first ideas. Now, let's think about the first verse. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. First thing you see is a prepositional phrase, right? In the beginning, and then we have the subject, God, and we have a verb, created, and then we have the direct objects, what he creates, the heavens and the earth. So that is a summary of everything that goes on in this first verse. This whole book is really uh, talked about in the, in the same area. And so uh, this word here, God, is even plural, we'll see in the, as you go down, especially in, in chapter 3, it says he kicks him out of the Garden of Eden so they not become like us. Why would God use a plural pronoun to describe himself? You know why that would be? Trinity. The Trinity. Trinity. And the Trinity is all found here. Even in, even in Ephesians, it says that the Holy Spirit and the Son were involved in the creation process. So uh, it's the idea of a plural is being used as we work through this situation. But we find that God's so he's totally self-sufficient. Are you self-sufficient? No. <laughs> Not. None of us are. I need somebody to cook my food for me. I guess I could do it myself, but you know, I'm not self-sufficient. I need forces outside of myself to do certain things. And the only person that's true of that doesn't need to ask God. He doesn't need anybody to do anything for him. So he's totally self-sufficient, and there's nothing outside of himself. And, you know, we can't limit him in any way. And so this, the fact is that God created something suggests that he must have something very, very special. Why he created it. Uh, you know, most of the time when you do something, there's some purpose to it. You know, well, we don't just do something for no reason at all, do we? And when God created, there was some very special purpose for what he did. It wasn't just done for, uh, you know, in a haphazard uh, situation, but it was done for a very specific reason. That was for his glory. So he would get glory that he does this. Now, only God can create. You ever think about that? Nobody else can create. And you say, well, I can create something. No, you use material that's already been created, 
made in order to create something else. You don't create where there's going to be ex nihilo out of nothing. Uh, he's the only one who can do that. So he's the only one who can make forms or men or individuals out of nothing at all. And so he speaks and this universe comes into existence. And we find that really he had nothing to do with his work. It's just his voice that does all of this. Heaven and earth is a division between the two types of matter that he creates. Okay, he creates space, okay, heavens, and then substance would be earth. And so both of those are very, very important for us to understand. And um, in the beginning is space is time, and it's before this time that we have. And so he sets, he starts time at this point. And so these words, all these words have some very specific beginning. A man named Spencer in the 19th century, he said everything exists in five categories. Think about this. Everything exists in five categories. And this verse talks about all five categories. First thing is, it says that the first thing that exists is time. And so how's the verse start? In the beginning. So you have time taken care of. The second thing is action. I'm sorry. Uh, first thing is time. Second thing is force. Thirdly is action. And then you have space and you have matter. Anything that happens, happens and functions in those five areas. It's time, force, action, space, and matter. And so in the beginning is time. God is the force. Uh, he created, that's the action. And heavens are the space. And the earth is the matter. So all the essential elements that you and I still function with are found in this first verse in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Because all of them are encased in this very, very important verse. Now, notice we find that um, as he does this, it says each action that he does has a logical sequence to it. Verse 2, okay, he's created. And it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And so, all these ideas are that they build upon one another. Without form and void. A lot of people have got hung up on that. It simply means that it wasn't complete. There's no inhabitants. It's void of life. Uh, he created the substance, but he did that and did not put into that substance any kind of life at this point. Now, that's going to be the process of chapter 1 of Genesis. But all the raw materials are being made at this first chapter, in verse 2 of chapter 1. And we also find that the idea of darkness here is the idea it's not been energized. Okay? Light energizes things, doesn't it? Now, you all are smart individuals. If a plant has to grow, you've got to have certain things. You've got to have three things for a plant to grow, don't you? Nutrition, water, and light. Am I right? Yeah. And if they don't have those three things, it's going to die. We've got flowers in our house right now that are about to die because they don't have any water. Okay. And uh, they need to have some water with them. But that light is that which is going to energize the things that are there. And so we find that the idea here in verse 2 is that everything was sort of dark. Uh, not that it's, uh, this is not ethical. Uh, but you know what I mean by that? It's not that it was evil. It simply means that it was not energized by the light. And then when the light was given, everything starts to spring to life because of the energy that that light would bring. And it really is not in any kind of a shape. Okay? It's sort of a, uh, we used to play with these big blobs of whatever you call them. That are just, you just mold them into all kinds of different things. Well, that's sort of what the earth is, and you can sort of see God's hand start to mold this blob of material, the way I view it, into something that's very, very important. And so this physical universe is about to come into existence. But everything is still dark, no form, no motion, no light. And it says here that uh, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So the Spirit of God, the name is Elohim here, again, plural, idea of he is the one who's going to bring and light up the creation. He's going to bring life to this mass of material that God has now put into, po into force. And, you know, we see the Spirit of God is the action and that he was all that was needed. He needed to organize this and put it into some kind of a, a place. And, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is said to be here. It says he, is, he moved over the face of the waters. 
That word moved is an interesting word. In Hebrew, it has the idea of, of a mother hen hovering over her chicks. Have you ever seen that happen? You know, she sort of, I used to tell a story whenever I was at Wayside, uh, and my dad used to tell the story all the time of the fire. You ever heard the story about the fire and, and the, over, the, over the Canadian plains, and of course, chickens are out there, and this one hen brings all of her little chicks. And You've heard this story? You never heard that story? Well, let me tell it to you real fast, okay? They're out there in the Canadian plains, and there's these wildfires that branch up, and, and he's built this farmer's built his circle, and he's way out by himself. And so one day he can smell the smoke, and he starts trying to wet everything down, all his hay and everything, because when these fires come, they just sweep, like they're doing right now in Canada, right? And so um, he's on this farm, and, and, um, and this gets closer and closer. And as it gets closer, he sees this hen of his, and she's starting to gather in all the little chicks underneath her. And uh, he looks at this, and he thought, you know how great that was. And so after the fire is over, and it's spread throughout the entire place, and burn everything off, and, and he goes out, and he looks over his farm, and he looks, and here's the old hen. She's just burnt to a crisp. And he feels, you know, he feels pretty bad about this because it's his favorite chicken. And uh, he goes over and looks at her. He sort of kicks her out of the way. And guess what happens? All the little chickies run out from underneath her wings because she protected them through the fire. Every time I think about this hovering, I think about that same idea. You know, he's hovering over the creation. You know, that would be a good salvation, you know, illustration for that. But he's hovering over this creation. And he has it all set ready so that he's, he's going to move, make it into something very, very special. And so he's moving along under over these things. He's the energizer. Okay? He's the one who is motivating all this. He's the one who is uh, the gravitational force. You know, just putting gravity to this world would make a big difference, wouldn't it? Think about it. Just push things into place. So this is the foundation. Just two verses. It really sets the tone for everything else that exists, and you know what happens next. Okay, we've got days of creation. I'm not going to go through all the days of creation with you because you can probably tell me what was created on each day, can't you? Sure you can. Light and the firmament. I'll probably miss one or two. And then we have, uh, the, no, I'm sorry, uh, day and night and then uh, the firmament and then uh, uh, land. land and then you have the creatures. Sun. You have the sun and the moon and the stars. And then you have uh, the dry ground and so on and so forth. Well, anyway, it proceeds, all right, for seven days. And what does God do on the last day? Of course, he rests. In the last six day, he creates man. And that is the capstone of his creation. Now, it's a very, when you think about the created order, very logical sequence, isn't it, to it? I mean, you have to have land first in order for these things to happen. And then you have to have the water unveiling or going to its gathering place so the land can appear. The firmness is the division, you know, between the, the sky and the, and, the, and the earth itself. And of course, after the, after the, after the, um, uh, the, land, after the plants and you have the animals. You miss the birds and the water creatures. Birds and the water creatures, absolutely. So they're in there too. But you know, it, it develops the same way. Now, you know, it happened in a very logical, very orderly way that God put this thing together. And then, of course, his last creation was man. And uh, that's what's happening in the entire chapter. And we find that he says, it's in chapter 1, that he says uh, it was very good. Uh, he approves of it. Can you imagine what it must be like to be approved by God? It would be great whenever somebody says, you know, you did a good job. Maybe you've had that happen to you. I'm sure you have sometime in your life. But when God tells you you've done a good, you've done a good job, you know, that's really significant. And he looks over his creation, his order, and he says, boy, you know, uh, everything looks really good. And he puts his a stamp of approval upon it. And in chapter 2, it says when they were finished, he kind of recapitulates. Uh, that's a musical term, isn't it? He, uh, uh, he, he rehearses again. The, um, the whole order of creation and how it all happens. And he goes back through this order. And then he uh, talks about something started in verse 8 called the Garden of Eden. I'm sure you've heard about that. What's the word Eden mean? Anybody know what Eden means? Pleasant place. Pleasant place, absolutely. Very good. What a place it must have been. Can you imagine what it must have been like? Beautiful. 
no rain. You know, some dew came down in the morning. I mean, I'm tired of rain already. I don't know about you all. Rain on the way over here. And no rain, and everything's water, and everything's green. And uh, there's this, you know, these four rivers that come out of this, and they're described. And then in verse 16, he says to me, because he puts Adam, and he puts Eve in this garden, because, remember, well, she's not been created yet, but he puts Adam there, but Eve's there as well. And he says, verse 16, you can eat of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. I like that word adverb, freely. You know, just go out and get it. Um, I remember whenever I got in a, you ever get in a blackberry patch or raspberry patch and you can mm. freely eat? Boy, you know, all holes are all, all are blueberry. We used to pick blueberries up in Ohio and uh, they would let you eat the ones you wanted to and then you put the rest of the bucket and pay for them. And I think I ate more than I put in the bucket. <laughs> you could freely eat of what you were going on. Well, that's sort of what's going on here. You can freely eat of anything you want. Uh, so that'd be great. In verse 17, there's a word, but. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So God made his instructions very, very plain, didn't he? Well, he says, anything in this garden, and think about this, anything you want is yours, but I've got one tree that I'm going to put off limits. Now, this tree was not somehow organically poisoned or organically sinful. Uh, the sin is not so much in the fruit, it's in the, disobe the disobeying, disobeying what God says. That's the test that's being put here. Uh, there's nothing probably, this tree is probably not any different from anything else as far as the actual organic makeup and the looks of it. But uh, it's the idea that God has stated this is what I expect of you. Same thing is true today gives us the commands and laws that we are to follow. And so, you know, that's what he's done for us. And we find that, you know, he goes down here and he finds that uh, he looks over all these beasts and it says in verse 18, the Lord said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make for him a help me for him. And I formed out of the ground and he gave all the, he makes the course in verse 22, it's he took a rib and out of the man, he made a woman and brought her to the man. Now, this, this verse is very important in our day and age because, you know, we're starting to try to break down everything that God has stated. But the word here is very, very important. And I, maybe I've told you this before, but I love Matthew Henry's commentary on this, that he did not make, he did not take the woman from the man's head to rule over him. He didn't take it from the man's feet to, be, to have her underneath him, but he took it from his side so he could love and cherish her. And I think that's exactly what should happen when it comes to marriage. Yes, there should be that idea of loving and cherishing one another. And, of course, when Adam sees her, he's sort of taken back. Can you imagine what Eve must have looked like, what Adam must have looked like in those areas? They must have been perfect in every way. And so, uh, because they were made by God, and they were made uh, in a mature state. And so it says, she's now, new, now bone, my bone and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then we have the verse on marriage. They're going to be together, and uh, they're going to be naked and not ashamed. In other words, there's going to be an openness between this man and woman as they fellowship with one another. But they're going to set up their own house, and they have their own uh, life together, and they're going to love one another. I just have one little story I've got to tell you about that, and this is the only thing I'll tell you about marriage. This man decided one day that, and this is really to me what love is all about, especially the biblical love that we're talking about. This man is, um, he's decided that he's going to go and ask his boss for a raise. And boy, he's going to ask in fear and trembling because he don't know how the boss is going to react to this. And so uh, he says, his wife that morning says, now, honey, today's the day. I'm going to go ask for my raise today. I deserve it. I know I do. And she says, yes, you do. She says, yes, you just go ahead and approach him. And so all day long, he's running, around, he's running around the office, and he's so nervous about things and apprehensive. But late in the afternoon, he finally gets enough courage, and he finally comes to his employer, and to his delight, the boss says, yes, you get the raise. He's elated about this. Boy, you know, it's great, great to get a raise. I'm sure you all had raises in your life, okay? Maybe you don't work yet, but you know what I'm saying? Maybe you got your allowance raised one time. I don't know. You got a raise. <clears throat> And so he's all fantastic about that. And so that evening he comes home. 
And when he arrives home, his wife has set the most beautiful table. They have candles in the lit. All kinds of stuff going on over here, too. Candles that are lit. And all kinds of things are going on. She had this marvelous feast all prepared for him. He thought to himself, somebody tipped her off, but I got the raise. And so he thought, that's great. And so uh, he's finding her in the kitchen, and he finally comes to her, and he tells her the good news, I got the raise. And of course, they embrace, and, and on, his, on his plate, she has this little card. And on the card it says, congratulations, darling. I knew you'd get the raise. The thing, this, these things will tell you how much I love you. And so he's feeling really good about the meal. I mean, here she is. She's understood and got the raise. And she's telling me this. And so it's time for dessert. And so as it's time for dessert, she goes out to the kitchen and he notices a second card has fallen out of her pocket and it's laying on the floor. And so he goes over and he picks it up. And he turns this card and he looks at it and it reads this way. Don't worry about not getting the raise. You deserve it anyway. These things will tell you how much I love you. And of course, the idea is total acceptance. She's going to love him whether he gets the raise or doesn't get the raise. That's really what love is all about. It's not about what we get, but it's how we can help and how we can appreciate other people. And we find that that was a marvelous situation for him because he realized just how much she loved him. Now, they are in the Garden of Eden. Things are going well. Everything is, everything is fine and dandy. I mean, can you imagine what the Garden of Eden must have been like? No weeds. You all garden, I don't know if you garden or not. No weeds. Go out and pick what you want. Uh, eat what you want. Any of the fruits. Beautiful scenery. Just a marvelous place. And really... If it was not for Genesis chapter 3, think about this. There'd be no need for the rest of the Bible. It could have just stopped right here. Because really, the rest of the book of the Bible is dealing with how God makes things right for us after we messed up. And so Genesis 3 is really the, the center. I mean, it's a very important point because from now on, everything in Scripture is going to talk about how God made us or we can have a relationship back with him because we lost it with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden whenever they sinned. Everything's complete. Everything was very good. When God puts his stamp of approval on something, it's good. There's no doubt about it. And so we find that uh, there was no problems. And Paul says that by one man sin entered the world. And man was persuaded, persuaded by sin to uh, by someone outside of himself. And we find that he's created an innocence, not perfection, but an innocence. And now he's going to be tested. And I want you to just spend a few minutes here. I want to read these verses to you. And notice what happens. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1. I was reading this to my grandson the other week. I was trying to make the point about disobedience and how terrible it is, right? That's a good lesson for all of us to learn. Now the serpent was more subtle. Isn't that interesting? When I think of a serpent today, I don't think of it as being subtle. You know, I think of it being kind of nasty. Then any of the beasts of the fields which the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, Yea, hath the Lord said, Shall ye not eat of every tree of the garden? You get the idea life was different in the garden than it was outside the garden? I don't find animals talking too many times, do you? After this, uh, this is really the only other place. One of the places I know an animal talk. Remember when that was? Balaam. Balaam's donkey talked to him one day when he was trying to go down the road. But here I find a snake. Now, I know Satan is involved in this, but if a snake started talking to me, I'd be afraid. It just doesn't seem to unnerve Eve at all. So the conclusion, and maybe I'm outside of what I should say here, but the conclusion I draw from this is that this must have been sort of commonplace for her not to repel against this very uh, bold animal speaking to her because we know after the curse, life was tremendously different than it was before the curse. And none of us know exactly what life was like before the curse because none of us lived then. 
You know, we don't understand it. We don't have, and we have no record except these two chapters of what it was like before the curse. So anyway, this serpent is talking to him. He says, uh, "Has the Lord said, you shall not eat of any tree of the knowledge, uh, any tree of the every tree? Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden." He asks a question, doesn't he? You know, Satan is a beautiful creature. I know you know he's not doesn't have horns and tail and all that good stuff. Um, you know the two places that define Satan for us? It'd be Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. <coughs> and also Ezekiel 28, verses 8, 11 through 19. He said they'd be very beautiful. He's called Lucifer, the son of the morning. And so he's not some kind of a trumped up, weird creature. Okay? He's one who's an angel of light. You can find in the New Testament. So that's how he comes to us. And also he's real. That's, some people have a discussion about that, but he's a real person. He's not omniscient. He's not all, all, he doesn't all not present. He can't be every place at once. He doesn't have all knowledge, but he's real. And his temptation is to accomplish a good thing in a bad way, usually. Okay, to pass the test, but to cheat. Uh, you know, he do things not against what God has told him in individuals to do. So what he does here is he's going to question. Notice the question mark at the end of this. Ye shall eat of every tree of the garden. So his, his uh, methodology here is to question God. Has God said this? He raised a question about God's goodness. If we go to James chapter 1, we find that when he tempts us, that's the way he does it all the time. Every time, God, every time Satan tempts you in, his, in your life, it's always going to be, is God withholding something from you? Do, is God holding something back? Why doesn't God let this happen or this happen to you? And he usually begins his temptations with some kind of a question in your mind about why you don't have this or why you don't have that or is God really that good, especially when something happens in our lives. And he's clever and he raises these questions and he's going to start questioning the word of God here because of what Satan does. Notice her answer. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Remember, she used out the word freely. Okay, God says you could eat freely out of the trees of the, of the garden. But she doesn't put that word in there. But she says, but of, the fruit of the, but of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, God said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. And of course, you know that's added by Eve, right? Unless you die. Anytime you add to God's word, you're in trouble. <laughs> And uh, we could talk a lot about that. If I was preaching a message, I would really get into that. But that's the point here is that, you know, you, you've got to be careful that you don't add to what God says. A lot of folks today are doing that. And here we find the result of that. And, you know, she even sort of softened.